Hello, welcome to It Gets So Lonely Here, a horror visual novel developed by Ibehime, available on Ichio. And well, it's about a bunch of pretty girls who will love you to death. I guess we'll see what that means. I guess a little content warning as well. This is a horror game, so viewer discretion is advised because it may contain some disturbing elements and whatnot. You're running through a forest. It is late at night, and the sky is as black as pitch. Black as pitch. Usually it's... You say pitch black, but... I don't know. That's... Oh, it's for me, for some reason, that <laughs> threw me for a loop. Black as pitch. Is that... Is that how that... Can you say that? Black as pitch? Pitch is... You don't say pitch is black. Anyway. <laughs> There's nothing to light your way, save for the moon's milky glow. But its rays cannot reach you. Not properly. The trees which surround you, jutting out of the earth like eerie monuments to a foreign god, are blotting out most of the light. You cannot see where you're going. Even if you had commenced your flight at a more sensible hour, however, with the light of the sun to aid you, it would be of little use. You do not know where you're going. You have no map, no route, no plan. You're running like a frightened animal, anxious and nervy with no destination in mind. You have no desire as you run, save to escape. You cannot let yourself be caught. If that were to happen, you are certain that you'll be ruined. You have no choice, therefore, but to keep going, on and on and on, though your feet are screaming at you for mercy. You have no idea how long you've been running. Time has begun to blend together, has lost all meaning. Something sharp snags the hem of your skirt, but you do not have the luxury to pause and examine what has happened. Instead, you tug. Your skirt tears, the sound splitting through the forest, and you stumble forward of a shocked gasp. You're free, but at what cost? No, not my skirt. <laughs> I guess. Your skirt has been irrev e uh, irrevocably... Why well, can't I say this word? You, ir irrevocably... Irrevocably, 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 irrevocably. I mean, I know what it means. You know, there's a lot of words. I know what they mean. Irrevocably it means like you know, it's like it's been damaged permanently, right? That's that's what it means. I just never like say it out loud. You know, I never pronounce things out loud. You know, there's a difference between like reading it silently and reading it loud. Anyway, but. Your skirt has been irrevocably damaged. It might be too late to worry about such trivial matters now, though. If you do not start running again, uh, if you do not start running again, then soon she will catch you. Then your life will be over. You do not know if she is still following you, but you do not want to risk looking over your shoulder. If you were to see her, silhouetted beneath a tree, looking at you with that sickly sweet smile, which once ensnared you, you would lose what little nerve you possess. Your legs would lock up and your blood would freeze in your veins. Then you would crumple. You would fall, but you would not hit the ground. She would be there to catch you. Did she not promise, when you made that contract, that you would never be alone? You would like to take back that silly wish of yours, but it's too late for that. It's too late for a lot of things. All you can do, or all you can do, is run. You run and run and run while icy fog swirls about your feet. It's cold enough to sap the heat from your body, and you shudder from it. It feels as though you're drowning. It feels as though you're being buried alive. Your knees and your shins, meanwhile, are bleeding. You cannot endure much more of this. If you value your own life, you must. You run and you run and you run until at long last, you reach a fork in the road. There are three paths which split off through the forest, or four if you count the path down which you came. You cannot exactly double back on yourself though, not when you have put so much effort into running forwards, or double back, or you cannot exactly double back on yourself. You can only press on. The three paths are signposted, which is something of a strange sight given you're so deep into the forest. Dark though it may be, You've grown accustomed to the shadows. 
which is about pick out the writing on this old, dilapidated signpost, curved and slanted though it is. Your fate, if you will forgive me for sounding cliche, is in your hands, like a visual novel where you get to choose between three choices. Now I wonder, which path will you take? Hold on, can I save? <laughs> Let me just scroll real, real quick and just like rewind. I can save. Anyway, all right. Okay, three choices. We can go to the shore, we can go to the village, or we can go to the castle. You know? And by the way, did I mention this visual novel is just um, Yuri? By the way, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just girls. Anyway, um, uh, I guess we'll go to the shore. I guess you know, maybe we'll just start from top to bottom because I don't have any particular preferences. Let's just go to the shore. I mean, uh, I, I, I guess we're running away from something. We made a contract with someone, and they're chasing us. I'm assuming through the forest. You know, maybe we should find like a boat or something. You know. Surely they can't, like, swim, you know, and they could, we could just, like, escape into the oceans. Uh, so you want to go to the shore? Good idea. What will you discover there, I wonder? This night is far from over, and there are any number of adventures still awaiting you. I hope that you've prepared yourself in advance, and I do hope, for your sake, that you've learned how to swim. I have a sneaking suspicion that this skill might come in handy, considering you're going, you know, in water, you know, we want not. You follow the path which leads to the shore, supporting yourself on weary, aching limbs, which feel ready to snap at the knee beneath the burden of your weight. You're a little more than the wisp of a girl, but you've been running for so very long, and your feet are so very numb, you feel like a great, lumbering thing. You need to lie down, and quickly. You only hope, as you continue to run, that you find a means to escape your current predicament by the shore. You do not know what awaits you, we have visions of a harbor extending out to the horizon, cradling a fleet of white-sailed fishing vessels. Surely there'll be a kindly fisherman who'll be willing to take you far, far away on this boat, to a place where your pursuer will not be able to find you. You can imagine, too, the face of this kindly fisherman, a face you have lifted from the fairy tales you read in abundance as a small child. You'll have thick, bushy eyebrows and a dark brown beard streaked through with gray. He will look intimidating at a glance, but he'll be fiercely protected of you, just like a father. You do not know what fathers are supposed to be like. You have daddy issues. I mean, no, um, <laughs> you're only imagining. It is your imagination, however, which grants you the strength needed to keep going. You run to the shore. It takes some time before you finally emerge from the woods, but finally you do it. How much time, you ask? I cannot answer that. Did I not say that time had begun to lose all its meaning? The forest is behind you now, at least, on all the awful nightmares that lurk within it. It is still cold, though, and still foggy. It is still dark, too. The sun has yet to rise. You can see the moon more clearly now as it hangs above your head, round as any pearl or orb or crystal ball. The moonlight shines down upon the verti ver ver another word. Upon the vertiginous, 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 right? Vertiginous. The moonlight shines down upon the vertiginous cliffs, which plummet sharply downwards to an array of sharp, spiky rocks below. You felt, upon escaping the woods, a degree of hope, but the sight of, the, of these weather-blasted cliffs gives you pause. You inhale, then you frown. Now. What are you to do? You did not think this plan of yours through very well. Not that you had much in the way of a plan in the first place. There is little in the way of civilization here. The cliffs are far from the village. How far, you do not know. And you cannot see any houses. Where exactly will you rest your weary head and one of your weary legs? Pitfully, you look around. There is nobody to your east, nor is there anybody to your west. There is no point in looking south. That's the way you came, and when you look to the north, the world falls away from you. The cliffs are too steep to scale, and it's too dark. Naturally, there's not a soul here to help you. You're on your own. It's just you and the fish. You feel so overwhelmed, you could very well cry. You do not cry, however. You know that tears have never helped anyone. You got yourself into this mess. Now, you need to get yourself out of it. 
It is with this thought in mind that you inhale a, a lungful of salty ocean uh, oceanic air. Does he pronounce that? Oceanic? Then you begin your exploration in earnest. You keep away from the edge of the cliffs, afraid that you might slip and take a sudden unfortunate tumble into the abyss below. You're not as attached to your mortal body as some humans are, but you don't want to die. You still care for yourself, if only a little. And it is this sense of self-preservation which compels you onwards. You glance this way and that, depressing the tall grass beneath your shoes as you search for a place of shelter. Surely there must be somewhere. You cannot see any likely looking settlements, but what is that over yonder? Could that be a roof? You hurry onwards, hope budding anew in your heart, and so at long last you reach your destination. You know, someone's house in like a rust server or something, I don't know. Uh, there's a house after all, out here in the wilds, though it doesn't at a glance look very welcoming. The solitary house that you have discovered, not so far from the cliffs, is rather unremarkable. It's so small and squat, you cannot imagine it contains with it more than one floor. You know what I mean? It reminds me, I mean, it reminds me of any kind of like, um, how do you say, like survival, like crafting game, like 3D, you know, 3D survival crafting game. That's not Minecraft, <laughs> you know, basically. So you always build like a, like a little wooden shack and everything in those games. But uh, you cannot even imagine it contains much more than one room. Though it's dark, it's not dark enough to mask that the cottage has something of a slant to it. It's leaning listlessly to one side, like a drunken sailor. The thatched roof, meanwhile, which tops this dwelling, has certainly seen better days. There's a hole in the, in the thatch. There are several holes in the thatch. And parts of it look particularly bare, almost bald. Bald house. That's rather concerning. Should it rain, you will not be properly protected from the elements. Did you really stay the night in such a place? You have some misgivings. Do your misgivings matter, really, when there's nowhere else to go? Well, you gotta punch some trees. Just, you know, go back to the forest, just punch trees with your bare hands, you know, and then make an axe from your from your crafting table, and, you know, fix the roof or something, I don't know. No, um, it's not as though you have any other options. It is with a sense of defeat, therefore, that you approach the cottage, which sticks out of the earth like a tombstone. However you want to turn back, but you know that'll be foolish. The windows of the cottage are dark, but that does not necessarily mean it's empty. Also, I'm going back and forth with contractions. I always, I don't know, I, I naturally want to like contract words, you know, instead of saying it is, I want to say it's because that's more conversational. Because that's usually how I speak. But I guess the game really is not really using contractions, um, which makes it feel a little, a little, a little formal. It feels a little like stiff, but maybe that's intended. Hey, I'm, uh, I think I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll read everything as intended. Instead of using contractions, I'm just very tempted to do so. But, um, it is rather late at night after all. Whoever lives here, if indeed anybody does live here, uh, might be asleep. You cannot imagine the owners of this cottage will appreciate being roused so very late at night. You cannot let yourself worry too much about these small details, however. Otherwise, you'll never get anywhere. You swallow taste of the salty sea breeze is pungent in the back of your nostrils. Then you wrap the knuckles of your right fist on the door. You rap quietly at first, but you do not hear any resultant shuffling inside the cottage. Hmm, that means it's free real estate, right? You can just go in. Perhaps you do not use enough strength. Emboldened. Emboldened. That just reminds me of Elden Ring. Emboldened by ambition or what is it what he says like emboldened by foolish ambition anyway um emboldened you wrap your knuckles on the door for the second time more loudly this time you wait a few moments but still you cannot hear anything perhaps the cottage is unoccupied after all you knock for a third time and wait the third time is that as they say the charm but for all that your knocking goes unanswered goes, goes unanswered well, nobody can say that you did not try. More intrigued now than anxious, your fingers find the handle of the door. You pull it down and to your surprise it yields easily. The door swings back for you as if by magic. It feels as 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 most as as Moses, as Moses Jones. No, it feels almost as if this was preordained. You step foot inside the cottage, which is very dark, 
and glance around. It is hard to see given the lateness of the hour, but the cottage's interior is about as inspiring as its exterior. Which is to say, not very. It is every bit as small and as cramped as he fancied when you observed it from the outside. There are a few cupboards which line the walls, a wood fire which has since been extinguished, and a straw pallet on the floor which must function as a bed. Your search is unsuccessful, however, when it comes to trying to locate other humans. You cannot find another soul. Surely that is your, your benefit, though. If nobody else lives here, then you might as well make yourself at home. Or at home as one can be, I suppose, in a small cramped cottage such as this, with holes in the roof. You close the door behind you and approach the straw pallet. All of a sudden, you feel incredibly wary. The tiredness that assails your limbs is absolute, so intense it overcomes the last of your concerns. You settle down upon the straw pallet, yawning as you do. It's not comfortable, but being able to lie down eases some of your aches and pains. Lying down, even on an uncomfortable makeshift bed such as this one, is better than standing. It is far, far better than running. Well, time to go to sleep. Time to go to sleep and save your game. Your eyelids fall shut, your lashes melting together. And soothed by the sounds of the wind and the distant rolling of the waves, you fall asleep. You know, a natural, you know, ocean wave ASMR. Then you begin to dream. It's not uncommon, of course, to dream. The best and the worst of us do it. From the queens in their castles to peasants sleeping in the straw. Why, who is to say that all you have observed tonight has not, in a sense, been a dream of its own? Would that make your nighttime fancies then a dream inside a dream? Perhaps our dreams are empty, hollow things stacked inside one another like little wooden dolls. Is that not a whims whimsical thought? How very droll. The dreams, however, cannot be called whimsical, and neither are they particularly droll. They are not pure fabrications, as dreams sometimes are leading fancies which can never come to pass. Dreams are more of, of a rather pernicu perni pernicuous. Pernicuous? Is that how you say I so much of words? This, this writer is really... Pernicious. Pernicious. I want to say pernicuous. Pernicious. Pernicious meaning uh, having a harmful effect the more in, in the more gradual or subtle way, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I was gonna say uh, the 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 writer or the developer is really giving me a, a run for my money, you know, because there's so many words that I can't say. Uh, your dreams are of, are of a rather more pernicious sort. In your dreams, you're at the cons conservatory, conservator, conservator, cons conserv conservator. I don't know what that is even. An establishment for a special instruction. Particularly for music and theatrical training, yes, or like a public place for the music and the arts, or like a music school, basically. It has something to do with the arts, basically. Um, in your dreams, you're at the conservatoire with your red hair tied back into two prim, proper braids. You're walking through the courtyard, clutching your books to your chest as you make your way to the library. Your head is bowed, so as not to look at the faces of your passing classmates. You do not want to meet their eyes. These girls, with their sensible braids and their sensible shoes, are merciless. Are merciless? Merc or merciless, rather. You hunch your shoulders together in, in, this, in this dream of yours, so as not to draw their attention, but alas, it is not enough. You stumble, clumsy thing that you are, and you fall. And just like that, all eyes are upon you. They're staring at you. They're laughing at you. They're doing the ohime laugh, going, oh, 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 oh. You lay there on the ground by the fountain, your books scattered, and you're screwed in a woeful state of disarray. Your knee hurts. Is it bleeding? You examine your injured leg, trying not to cry, and as this transpires, you hear a voice. One of your classmates is calling out to you. He has acknowledged you. You look up shyly, tears beating your eyes, a girl taller than you and prettier and much more refined. She extends her hand towards you. Does she mean to help you? It cannot hurt to try, can it? Hesitantly, you reach out to accept her offered aid, and that's when she turns you around and suplexes you. Um, the fingers curl around yours tightly, perhaps too tightly. Her nails dig into your skin. It hurts. 
Deftly, the girl pulls you to your feet. Your legs feel weak from your fall, your knee is still aching, still bleeding. You stumble, feeling out of sorts, but you're not afforded much of an opportunity to gather your bearings. The girl's hands are on your shoulders. She's laughing at you. Then she's pushing you. Ah, what? You, 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 you just pick me up only to push me down again? I fall down, and I get up again. Never gonna keep me down. The sound of the fountain and the running water which drums against his basin is all of a sudden very loud. It's overwhelming. It surrounds you. Then, it engulfs you. It is cold as ice. You cannot breathe. The rushing of the water continues, echoing in your eardrums over and over, and then... No. You do not want to remember this. What good will it do? It is in the past, but the past ought to remain. You're never going to go back. Not even your dreams. It is this determination which forces you back into the world the waking of a start. You gasp like a fish as you sip upright, your eyes unnaturally wide, splashing like a magic carp. If you wearied from the lack of sleep and with half-lidded eyes, you glance about. It is still dark inside your cottage. The sky visible from beyond the window splash still with stars. No longer you asleep. You're not sure. You don't have a clock with you. Have clocks been invented yet? I don't know. I feel like... I don't know. Actually, I don't know the context of this uh, setting. Are we in like a medieval kind of like place? Because they mentioned like a castle. I don't know. I don't know when clocks were invented. You know, I guess you would use a sundial if you didn't have a clock back in the day. Anyway. Uh, the dream was so very detailed. It really did feel that you had been transported into a different time. Into a different place. When you inhale, you could taste rank, fetid water in your mouth. Tentatively, you pat yourself down, your fingers trailing against the front of your uniform. So vivid was your, was your dream, you half expect to find that your clothes are damp. This is not the case, however. I actually always, uh, sometimes that happens, actually. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like you feel like, like you sweat so much in your dream or something. And like you feel like, you know, like your clothes are all wet, but like you shack and it's not really the case but anyway uh you're in fact perfectly dry well now uh, now what are you to do we go back to sleep that sounds like the best option available to you you are very tired but your senses feel too overwrought all of a sudden for sleep you do not think you could bear it on unsteady legs you rise to your feet and stand by the window you look out to the starry sky and to the pitted moon which hangs amongst them and you frown you can hear the wind outdoors, howling like an injured animal, and more softly the ebb and flow of the waves as they meet the cliffs. But that is not all. What is that sound? Why, it's almost like singing. The voice is far away enough that you cannot pick out any individual words, nor even the individual syllables, but there's a haunting quality to it all. The singer, whoever they are, possesses quite the pretty voice, high and clear like a bell. The song is a melancholy one, which stirs your heart. Curiosity takes root inside you, as it did during that fateful day you found that book in the library. Logically, you know you should not go outdoors to seek the source of that singing, but emotionally? That is another matter altogether. You really should have learned your lesson by now. You should know better than to go sticking your nose into business which does not concern you. But naughty little girls such as you never do learn. You cross the old fisherman's cottage as though in a dream, then reach for the handle of the door. The handle depresses easily enough beneath your grasping fingers, and the door opens with a click. The rest of the world yawns before you, framed in the doorway, all of it bathed in moonlight. You thought it was cold inside the old cottage, but it is colder still that the door is open. An unpleasant wind rushes forth to meet you, knifing mercilessly through the fabric of your uniform. You look across the cold, inhospitable landscape. Your fingers clench into fists at your side. Like Arthur from that meme. No, uh, then you step out into the unknown. You canvas the cliff face, led by nothing more than the, that luxurious singing. So haunting and ethereal is his voice, as it hangs on the breeze, it'd be enough to send 1,000 ships off to war. Hmm, maybe like a siren? You know, that's what I'm thinking. You keep walking into the night until you reach at the very edge of the cliffs, where they drop downwards into empty air. 
He ought not to go any further, but the voice has yet to cease. You can still hear it echoing inside your head. Is it like the music that's playing right now? And by the way, the, the, the music is pretty good. It compels you to act. You look down at the shore, which seems like a dizzying distance away, and out into the ocean, which is breaking against the scattered rocks below. Your eyes narrow with determination. Then you take a step towards the cliff. These cliffs are steep, and the rocks below them are sharp. You can see them glinting in the darkness, their tips jagged like the teeth of hungry predators. The cold wind blows, rocking your hair and you shudder from it. The shoes are not built for scaling cliffs, and your heels do not have much in the way of purchase, particularly not when the cliffs are so steep. Playing into the cliffs is no small feat, yet you are determined to ease yourself down onto the shore, in one piece preferably. I guess we're parkouring, you know, like uh, in Uncharted. Just simply parkour down the cliffs. The wind is so powerful, it feels as though there's something deliberately malicious to it. You wonder during your descent if it means to knock you off your perch on purpose to cast you down to the rocks below. Well, if that's what it wants, then you refuse to give it the satisfaction. I reject you, nature. You can be awfully stubborn at times, and now is one of them. You continue to climb. How long has it been? Uh, has it, or how long have you been at it now? Until at long last, your feet meet the shoreline below. You've made it, and you've not sustained too many injuries. Your palms are throbbing, yes, after gripping those rocks. You might have a few cuts, but your wounds are of a shallow and superficial sort. Things could have been worse. You flex your fingers, you feel uncomfortably numb, and cold alongside it. Your skin is prickling, but at least you can still feel discomfort. At least it is still attached to your bones, or it ought to be. Your vital organs conceal within the hollow cavity of your body. You have a lot to be thankful for. This night has, by and large, been quite successful. There are no longer any obstacles between you and the mysterious voyage which lure, lulled you outdoors. Now you must find them. You set off down the shore on the hunt of the singing voice which has captivated you so. You sidestep sharp, jagged rocks which jet out of the sand like teeth. The rocks which cannot be circumnavigated. Circumnavigated. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've heard of circumvented, but circumnavigated. I don't know. I've just never seen that word before. Um, but yeah, they cannot be circumnavigated. Meanwhile, you clamber over. All the while, the sound of the sea mingles with that of the singing. It provides an ethereal haunting backdrop to your exploration, one which further adds to the surreality of your moonlight stroll. Surreality or surreality, maybe? I think I read that wrong. Anyway. The waves lap against the shore, then recede shyly, pushed and pulled by the bleach-white moon which hangs overhead. The oceans that you've seen in your library books were, were all blue as sapphires, but this ocean is different. It's so late at night, it looks black instead. The undulating surface of the water reminds you of a mirror, though its depths are even deeper and much more mysterious. A sense of foreboding settles upon you, but you try to quash it. Do not let yourself be afraid. Ah yes, mermaid. And by the way, I recognize the art style. You know, I saw some screenshots in the store page, but the art was, I believe, drawn by at least the you know the character art anyway is drawn by um, Osinasi. I think I played one of their games before. Uh, what was it called? It was, um, what was it called? It was called. Uh, optimal conditions for a sacrifice. Yeah, that's what it's called. optimal conditions for a sacrifice. That's uh, that was a game made by the artist, I'm assuming or the character artist for this game. Anyway, this is recognizing you know. Um, you round a corner, your feet unsteady in their sensible brown shoes, and then at long last, you see her. There's a woman sitting upon a rock out in the ocean. The woman's eyes are closed and her lips are parted. Her expression, soulful. She is singing. Her hair, which is fair, flows around her face like a shroud, which adds to her otherworldly aura. Her eyes might be closed, but her lashes are long and luxuriant, like a doll's. Her lips, meanwhile, which are parted in song, are soft, like the freshly plucked petals of a flower. Her face is perfect, 
as are her proportions. Just proportions, you say, as I look at her fishtail. Her neck is tall and slender like the stem of a flower. As for the lower half of her body, meanwhile, well, a fish is fine too. No, I mean, it's nothing like anything you haven't have ever seen before. Or it is it is nothing like anything you have ever seen before. Okay, I was gonna, I thought it was gonna be like, hey, you know, it's not like it's, it's not like I haven't seen before. You know, as in like you've seen this before or something. But no, it's it's nothing like you anything you have ever ever seen before. As in you've never seen this before. Anyway, it's confusing to me. Anyway. But it's nothing like anything you have ever seen before. It is here and here alone that the woman betrays her narrow human definitions of beauty, for her legs are non-existent. Rather than two awkward appendages. The woman has instead the sleek, shimmering tail of a fish. I guess the protagonist. I guess the protagonist is really into fish. Is she not then a human? You know who cares? You know, reject bipedal. You know, reject bipedalism. Embrace fish tail. She cannot be, or she cannot be, not with a tail like that. This unusual sight makes you gasp, and quite audibly at that. You do not mean to be rude, but you cannot help yourself. Humans tend to react poorly to things they do not understand. At least you do not scream. That would be even ruder. Okay. Oh my. You meant to observe the mermaid from a distance, but it appeared that your shocked gasp was loud enough to attract her attention. The fish-tailed vision sitting upon the rock is looking at you. Her gaze is so piercing, it almost it feels almost as if she's looking through you. Your heart seems to stop inside your chest, as if by some manner of magical spell. You thought the mermaid pretty when first you observed her, sitting on that outcrop of rock, her face turned in profile. Now she is looking at you, however, and you can see that you are mistaken. She's not just pretty, she's beautiful. So much so, it is almost unnerving. She looks as though she has stepped out of the pages of a picture book, or like from that one Disney movie. <laughs> that one... You know, I feel like everyone knows about that, like, Star is a Mermaid. But anyway, uh, she's simply too perfect to belong to this world. You know, I feel like whenever, uh, when everyone, when anyone ever thinks of a mermaid, you know, you always think of, you know, Ariel. Anyway, uh, perhaps she is some kind of vision, a waking dream, a hallucination. But no, she is none of those things. Her tail might be an impossible thing, but its scales look slick and wet regardless. Like those of any fishes one might find at the market. These scales are iridescent, and bathe beneath the light of the moon, they seem almost to glow. The sight of her rather takes your breath away. You look at the mermaid. She looks back at you. You take out your fishing pole, you know, and you, you capture her. No, uh, you prepare yourself, expecting some sort of altercation. But the surprise soon fades from the mermaid's face. Her lips, which once were a person to frown, now shift upwards. She is smiling. Then she says in a refined sort of voice, Um, ara ara, <laughs> no, I mean, my my. It really is good to see a human again, particularly human girl. I was beginning to fear that your kind had all disappeared. I would no longer have anybody left to tell me of the world above the waters. My my. This is quite the effusive greeting. The mermaid's introductory speech is positively brimming of excitement of a sweet girlish variety. She's rather more amicable than the fine polish of her syllables would make one suggest. You might be a well-bred lady yourself with an accent to match, but you cannot help but feel overwhelmed. Anxiously, you observe the mermaid, and you ask her what she means. What happened? As to that, I'm afraid I cannot say. I've been sitting on these rocks and singing for many, many nights, but nobody has come to see me. There have been no lovely humans for me to play with. I was beginning to wonder whether your kind had disappeared altogether. I feared some manner of calamity had occurred while I was slumbering beneath the water's surface, and your kind has been eradicated. You shudder, then reassure the mermaid to the contrary. You do not know about the humans they used to speak with, but you at least have not been eradicated. Yes, you know, but you're still here. Yes, well, I can see that. The mermaid answers with a light laugh. It really is a relief. My fellow mer people who live beneath the water told me not to worry so, but I cannot help myself. 
I've always been fond of you humans. It was rather sobering, sitting here night after night all my own. It gets so lonely here. Title drop. Well, that's an interesting turn of phrase, considering that's the name of the game. It catches inside your head like a bird. Have you heard it before? So, dear human, did you say that you're unfamiliar with these parts? Hesitantly, you examine the mermaid. Thoughtless, though you might be at times, you're not so very self-centered that you cannot detect a note of longing in the mermaid's voice. It is evident, as she looks at you, that she's hoping for a particular answer to her query. This answer, alas, is not one that you can furnish her with. You do not want to lie to her. It is after some hesitation, therefore, that you reaffirm your earlier words, though this time you embellish them. You tell the mermaid that you're a traveler from a far-off land, one which is very dissimilar to this one. It is not a complete fabrication. You tell her that you've only just arrived by the shore. You're unfamiliar with both of your immediate surroundings and those further afield. If there's a village nearby, then you have never set foot in it. You do not know what the, do not know what this village is like, nor how many inhabitants it boasts. You do not know of a calamity, as the mermaid grimly supposed, has struck this land. But if she feels, or if she fears, all the humans within the immediate vicinity have been laying low by some mysterious, uh, mal malady, malady. I actually don't know how to say that word, malady. I mean, I've seen that word before, but I just never actually pronounced it. Malady. Malady. I guess really just malady. Disease. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the music have been laid low by some mysterious malady, then she needn't worry overly on that score. You're still alive. And I'm still alive. And when you're dying, I will be. A, uh, I'd rather. Uh, is it, when, when, when you're dying, I'll be still alive. No, anyway. <sighs> Are you not, you wonder, enough to satiate your curiosity of the human realm? Yes, that is true. You are here. I'm grateful. Naturally, for your company, although... Although... Wistfully, the mermaid sighs. I was rather hoping he might be able to bring me some news of the nearby village and of his inhabitants. This makes you wonder. Was there a particular person with the village she was close to? So, you were able to work that much out? The mermaid answers with a small smile. You are an intelligent one, aren't you? Your past professors will beg to differ in that score. You are always awful when it came to academics, mathematics in particular. It's too hard to do arithmetic. You can never get your head around all of the numbers. Your stern, stony-faced math professors used to despair in you. But she's not here. None of them are here. It is just you now and the mermaid, and she does not need to know about your dismal academic record. You allow yourself a small smile, touched by her compliment, and tell her that it was nothing more than a lucky guess. For a guess, it was remarkably accurate. You're quite right. I did have a close friend from the nearby village. She was very dear to me. Internally, you congratulate yourself on this piece of detective work. How very clever you are. You're very smart. There are many humans in this world of that, I know. The human who spoke with me, however, was special. She was my human. You do not fail to catch the possessive note in the mermaid's voice. And I cherished, or I cherished her dearly. She would come to me on my rock late at night, when she was finished with her chores, and we would talk. I asked her a good number of questions about the human realm, and about her customs. I fear my endless inquiries might have been rather tedious, but she was always happy to indulge me. She never once scorned me for my ignorance and neither did she make me feel like a fool. She always made time for me, no matter how many demands she had had on her time. She was a farmer's daughter, and she was awfully busy from dawn until dusk, threshing hay and taking the animals out of pasture. Or out, oh, I, well, I don't know why I changed that, but taking the animals out to pasture. She told me of her work, and I marveled at her. Slender though she was, she possessed a truly tremendous amount of strength. I, who have lived in the ocean all of my life, cannot countenance working as hard as she did, but she bore her burdens without complaining. 
she was not the prettiest human who has walked the earth. <laughs> That's kind of like a passive aggressive comment. But anyway, uh, she was not the or well, how, what do you just? Uh, it's like the it's kind of like an underhanded cl- a compliment or something. I don't know. Uh, she was not the prettiest human who has walked the earth, but that mattered not to me. You know, you don't say that to your girlfriend. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, her conversation was engaging, and I knew through our in- continued encounters that she meant no ill will. She did not even have a single drop of malice in her heart. The wistful manner in which the mermaid speaks of her friend makes you feel, for a brief moment, or for a few, or for a few brief moments, a flicker of some ugly primordial emotion. Could it be jealousy? It is painful, isn't it? To hear others wax poetic about those they hold dear, particularly when you yourself have never been so guarded in so intimate a matter, normies explode. <laughs> you have for many, many years been woefully alone. You are just forever alone. Um, but you're not alone now. You're with the mermaid, and she is with you. And though she might prefer to be in the company of an industrious farmhand, a farmhand is not here. Where does she go? Where does she come from? Han Nai Zhou. Um, oh, if only I knew. He quite simply disappeared one day, almost as if he had been whisked away by a wicked spirit. That seems like quite the anticlimactic ending for such a close relationship. Did the farmer not tell her companion before then that she might one day disappear? No, she did not. Nothing of the sort happened. It was all very sudden. So, you ask, feeling affronted upon the mermaid's behalf, did she not give you any warning? Not a single one. And when you and when, you ask, did she disappear? I do not know, in truth. Time is a strange concept of beings such as myself, particularly as it seems to ebb and flow differently both above and below the surface. You humans have a strange compulsion to pin down, to place labels upon everything. You have names for your seasons, and for your months, and even for your days of the week. It is all very precise. We merfolk, however, do not bother such affairs, because, or perhaps because, we live for so much longer than you humans do. We have no need to obsessively document our days, not when we have so many of them at our disposal. I mean, isn't it all relative, though? I feel like. I mean, we humans, for example, live longer than, like, a. I don't know. Like a spider. Or, like, you know, other, other animals or whatever. But we still feel like, you know. We still have, feel a sense of mortality, I feel like, you know? Would it not, not be the same for, like, a long lived beings such as a mermaid anyway that eventually you'll die you know maybe maybe not anyway this curious remark catches your attention how long exactly do mermaids live for you know they do say was there like a supernatural myth whatever where if you eat a mermaid actually you'll gain immortality so i always see it in like horror games and usually when that you know whenever there's like a mermaid curse or whatever like horror games are like horror stories or whatever um it usually ends badly though you know? okay. um the mermaid does not look much older than you do but you cannot help but wonder my my nosy aren't we the mermaid asks and she laughs a soft tinkling sound like that of a bell which makes you blush were you being nosy perhaps you were you always or you have always had a thirst for knowledge not of the dry dusty academic variety but the stories peopled with strange persons. Literature was the only subject you were ever any good at. You don't say. <laughs> it's like uh, I don't know. This is it's a little bit on the nose. I feel like when you when the, like um, a writer makes their like protagonist like a writer as well. But anyway, I, I think I complained about that in the past. But uh, whatever. <sighs> Again, it is hard for me to quantify, but to put it in terms of a human like you can understand. I suppose we mermaids can live for centuries. Centuries, and nanny? That is quite a surprise. But perhaps it shouldn't be. You've been subjected to any number of surprises tonight. What is one more to add to the pile? I have not been waiting quite that long, however, for my friend to return to me, but I think it's been but a few seasons. Well, how do you know that? You, you, you just said that you don't really obsessively you know, document the days anyway. It might not sound like much, but never before have I been so aware of the passage of time. 
I've experienced any number of wants during my life, but I've never wanted anything quite as badly as I want to see her. I wish she would sit with me, and she would talk to me just one more time. But perhaps I'm asking for an impossibility. I've been waiting for long enough now to presume that she'd not be returning to me. I fear that something must have happened to her, or to her family, or perhaps to her old village. You can hear the worry throbbing in the mermaid's voice, so potent that for a few moments you swear you can feel the depths of her sorrow within your own breasts. Her sadness over this human girl is a deep, dark thing, almost fathomless. Now, what's the legality of like a, you know, 500-year-old mermaid and like a human? You no, know, like, what's the age of consent here? Anyway, <laughs> uh, you cannot let yourself indulge it for too long. Otherwise, you fear you might drown in it. Ruefully, you tell the mermaid once more that you cannot help her. You're only a traveler after all. What do you know of a single insignificant farmhand in the nearby village? Yes, I thought you might say that. It is quite unfortunate, but... Oh well. I ought not to reflect upon all that I'm missing. That would be churlish of me. And it would not be fair to you either. You do not approach me, I'm sure, with the hope of hearing about all of my woes. I should be grateful instead, for all it is that I do have. I still have my long, long life which stretches before me like a golden cord. And of course I have you now. Does she? Do I not? I ought to go soon, before my absence is noticed, but will you not come and visit me again tomorrow night? I think I would like that. I've always enjoyed speaking to humans. You make me feel less alone. You cannot help but feel, as the mermaid observes you with those enchanting eyes of her, that she does not truly wish to speak to you for your sake. She just has a human fetish. You know, she has a fetish for a human being. No. Uh, she wants to use you instead as a substitute for the farmhand that she's been missing so very arduently. Or arduent? Ardently? Ard ardently? I don't know. I want to say arduently. I don't know how you pronounce that. Without stings, though, you really ought to be used to it. You know? Uh, well, I guess it will just be the rebound. Still, to be held in lower esteem than the farmhand of all things. Oh, dirty peasant. <laughs> no. It makes your self-esteem stink. You try not to let the mermaid notice this uh, elitism, however. The woes of your past are not her fault, much as the woes of her past are not yours. It is silly in any case to be jealous of a girl who might very well be dead. That is what you tell yourself. It's the only way to prop up your bruised sense of self-worth. You would, you tell the mermaid after a pause, like to see her again. You would like that very much. Oh, thank you. I've been feeling very gloomy for quite some time, but seeing you has invigorated me. Finally, it feels as though I can smile again. Did she not smile, you wonder, after her friend disappeared? I did not, no. I did not have the heart. Without her, the world seemed very dull and drab. Your company has cheered me immensely. This is why I like humans so much. You're not callous and unfeeling like the merfolk who live beneath the water's surface. You're much kinder than they are. Oh, if only she knew. If only she knew how degenerate human beings are. If the mermaid was aware, I wonder, of how petty you are and how jealous, would she still care for you? Well, that is neither here nor there. We simply keep those thoughts to ourselves. Good thing mermaids can't read our minds. Uh, you agree to me if the mermaid comes sundown the following night. Then make your slow, stumbling way back up the cliffs and to the college you have alone as your own. You just gotta like suck and do that every time. Climbing a cliff. No easier way. Once indoors, you settle down upon your pallet and then you close your eyes. The sighing of the wind outside and the distant rolling of the waves against the rocks do not disturb you. Or distant, distant roiling. Roiling. If you laugh your midnight counselor of a murish kind, quite at ease. Perhaps prematurely so. What happened to the icy fear which prompted your frantic flight through the forest in the prologue? <laughs> Where is all that gone? Do you not think you're being a bit complacent? No? Oh well. Don't worry about it. No. No, actually, you will. The following morning, which, uh, when it arrives, is cloudy and overcast. It's not a particularly pleasant morning, but at least it's not raining. There is some small consolation. 
You rise from your straw pallet, stretching, then glance about the interior of the fisherman's cottage. It looked dila uh, dilapidated last night, when much of it was obscured by the shadows. It looks even more so when subjected to the morning's light. The cottage's interior has a distinct disquieting appearance of having been abandoned in a hurry. There is broken pottery strung up upon the ground, and the singular wooden chair, which once must have stood by the singular wooden table, is lying on the floor. The doors of the cupboards, meanwhile, are ajar, the shelves within dis depressingly bare. The, a quick search reveals a handful of edibles, but there's precious little to be getting on with. If you wish to live here comfortably, you have to look into foraging. You ate very little last night, your stomach is empty. It was the malcontent rumblings in your stomach, in actual fact, which roused you from your slumber. But your body seems to be very far away indeed, much like the grey clouds which choke the sky. You gotta think of your own physical discomforts. You're dwelling instead upon the events of the night prior. You gotta help but think of the mermaid. Did you truly meet an aquatic maiden last night during your nightly stroll when you could not sleep? It sounds unreal. Especially now that the sun has risen and the shadows from the night prior have dispersed. You cannot quite believe it. It must have been a dream. But why then can you recall it so very clearly? You help yourself to the scant food or scant, 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 scant food and drink available to you, although I'll think of your next course of action. Now, what are you to do? The plan, of course, is to return to the shore come nightfall so that you might once again see the mermaid, but the night will not arrive for quite some time. You need to find some means of keeping yourself occupied until then. The uninspiring interior of the cottage does not furnish you with any particular ideas, so you decide to go for a walk. Your soul is still ache after your exertions last night, but if you go slowly, you ought to be alright. That's what you hope, at least. You don't want to spend much longer than you have, or you have to in the fisherman's cottage, no matter how cold it might be outdoors. It almost is as cold inside as it, as it is out. In any case, the cottage is far too small. You leave the cottage behind you and set off. You do not know where exactly you are going, but you suppose it does not matter overly much. You do not have any particular destination in mind. Your meanderings lead you to the cliffs, which are steel and sharp. Or steel? No, which are steep and sharp. Not made out of steel. <laughs> That'd be some very sharp cliffs. Uh, the drop to the shore is a perilous one, so much so that you have to wonder at how you were able to descend the cliffs the night prior to meet the mermaid. You are rather more determined than you ever realized. Although I, of course, could have told you that much. Also, who is I? You know, the narrator is a person himself, if you like. Uh, everything's being told from the second person. Uh, you are surprisingly capricious for such a small, slender human. Capricious? You walk along the side of the cliffs, keeping a, se a sensible distance away from the drop to the shore. You might have survived last night's excitement unscathed, but you do not fancy trying your luck. It would be so like you, really, to avoid the drop to your death in the darkness, only to stumble during the morning's light and take an irreversible tumble. Your fortunes have never been the fairest. Your meanderings along the cliff revealed to you all manner of curious flora. You thought the night prior the cliffs were weather blasted, but you can see now that your assumptions were incorrect. There are flowers here. Very warm and bright, like the sun's light during the summertime. Or you think of a flush of pressure, the fair hair of the mermaid, whom you are certain you spoke to last night. These flowers are so very like her hair it is uncanny. You step towards the flowers, drawn towards them, and sink down to your knees. The tall grass brushes your ankles like a caress. Or like a caress. The tall grass brushes your ankles like a caress. The morning's dew wetting your skirt. Your ripped skirt, by the way. You know, you fix that? I don't know. We don't have any sewing. We don't have a sewing needle with you. Now, your clothes are getting damp, as are your legs, but you care enough for this minor discomfort. You have just had an idea. Why not make a gift for your new friend? You're sure that she would appreciate it. Why would she not? She told you in a voice which was steep with dolor that she had been feeling lonely. You want to see her again. And when you next see her, you would like to make her smile. It is with this thought in mind that you begin to pick the flowers which are growing upon the cliffside. These flowers do not have any thorns, and the delicate stems snap easily enough between your fingers. 
take care when plucking these flowers, they leave a substantial amount of stem intact. You will need these stems so you might twine the flowers together. You mean to make for your mermaid a diadem. Diadem? Diad diadem? So many words that I don't know what they mean. Yes. Diadem. 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 You make, or you mean to make for your mermaid a diadem. Something she will be able to wear in her hair. This tiara is certain to suit her. She's so pretty, anything would suit her. You continue to work, slow and steadfast, as the weak sun shines. It takes time, but you're eventually able to fashion something you're satisfied with. You know, we're doing this instead of like finding, you know, food, you know, and water. You know, we're, we're near an ocean, but you can't drink it, you know. You gotta, you gotta find a source of water, you're gonna die of dehydration? No, I guess not. Uh, you only hope the uh, mermaid will feel similarly. If indeed she really does exist, it's not just a figment of her, you know, it's not a figment of her imagination, we've just hallucinated in our, in our delirium. Um, carefully, you pocket your makeshift diadem, then decide to forage for some food. You discover during your search some fruit trees whose sweet burdens are enough to fortify your spirits. Oh, that's, that's not lucky. For the present, at least. It is fortunate, really, that you're so excited about your moonlight rendezvous with the mermaid. If you're less focused upon the future and dwell more in the immediate present, you might have more of an appetite. The emptiness in your stomach assuaged, you return to the cottage, but as you mean to wait for the setting of the sun. There's very little to do, you soon discover, in the college other than checking the cupboards and sweeping the floor. Occupations which both feel depressingly pointless. There are no books to read either, with which you might pass your idle hours. You do, however, busy yourself with trying to light a fire so that you might ward off the cold. Time is horribly slow in passing, in part because you have precious little to do, but also you cannot stop thinking of the mermaid. Will she really return to shore as she said she would? Can you truly trust her? Well, you hope that you can. If she were not present in your designated meeting place, you think you would die from disappointment. You would just kill yourself, you're not right in the spot, nah. The seconds get to trickle by, unchecked by any hourglass. As they do, the sun sinks beneath the horizon. Part of you worries, however, that it might still be too early to search for the mermaid. Will she be there yet? You sit there, your stomach tied in anxious knots, as you listen to the wind which buffets your windows, you hear it. The sound is faint, but you recall it well from the night before. There's a single solitary voice outdoors, tempest tossed amidst the roiling waves. The voice is high, or is a high, clear one, a silvery, if indeed voices can have colors, like a finely polished dinner plate in a noble woman's home. The voice belongs, of course, to the mermaid. Who else do you know with a voice as angelic as that? You know, other than, you know, Hatsune Miku. A uh, relief begins to bubble up inside you. A relief so poignant you feel dizzy from it. She did not abandon you after all. Why, you wonder, did you ever think she would? She said that she wanted to see you. Did you think a mere, did you think of that a mere nicety? Uh, Boyd. Boyd? I, again, I, I've seen this one before, but like, uh, I say that. Buoyed. It's buoyed. See, English language. I don't know. I don't know. I, like the way it's spelled and the way it's pronounced. It's so weird. But it's buoyed? Buoyed? Buoyed. Buoyed? As if by a gentle breeze, you hurry to the door. With trembling fingers, they're tr trembling, I presume, from excitement rather than fear, you seize the handle, then turn it. Then you step out in the dark, inky night. You walk towards the cliffs as you did the night prior, beneath the cover of the inky blue sky, the wind moaning fitfully with every step you take. Your souls still ache from your expedition the day prior, but you are able to ignore this discomfort. It seems irrelevant, really, when compared to the prospect of once again meeting the mermaid. You've known her for only one night, yet she has come to mean more to you than your own uh, well-being. You would do anything for the mermaid if she asked. Well. Almost. What's the exception? You hurry down the sharp incline of the cliffs to the shore, almost stumbling your scuffed brown shoes, which really were not built with rock climbing in mind. So frantic are you in your attempts to once again make the mermaid's acquaintance, you very nearly fall. It's a good thing you still have enough sense about you to regain your footing. Otherwise, this tale will come to a premature ending. 
Eventually, you make your way onto the shore and approach the jagged outcrop of rock where you last saw the mermaid. Like the night prior, the mermaid is perched upon these rocks, with fair hair strewn about her shoulders. When she sees you from across the shore, she ceases her singing and her eyes light up. Or at least they seem to. So if you return to me, my hero, the mermaid says, and then lightly she giggles. Or perhaps, should I say, heroine. A praise makes you blush. You do not feel worthy of it. Nobody has ever called you a heroine before. You do not even think of yourself as a heroine. And to be honest, whenever I say heroine, I think of the drug heroine to be. You know, it's the same, I feel like it's the same pronunciation. <laughs> anyway. If a, story was, uh, or if a story were made about you, you had to think that you'd be a supporting character. One without her own voice. <laughs> Just like this one. Because, you know, you never actually... There's never actually like a dialogue with the main character. Uh, you're not interesting enough. So that's why I narrate everything for you. The mermaid seems to think that you are, though. She's staring at you delightedly, as though you're the one person in the world she most wishes to speak to. More like the only one. Uh, the thought makes you tremble, but not as much as the mermaid's gaze. You tell the mermaid that you do not think you're so very brave, but she dismisses your awkward remark with a laugh. I think you are. I saw the way you scaled those cliffs. I thought that was very heroic. It would be very, it would be very, um, not so heroic if she just fell from those cliffs and just died. You know, how would you feel about that? And, oh, she saw that, did she? And did she see how you slipped down the cliffs, grazing your palms in the process, and how you very nearly fell? You've never been the most graceful of girls, but you have your feelings exposed for being as posed and as perfect as the mermaid or yeah or have your feelings exposed before a being as poised and as perfect as the mermaid that stings a little bit more in fact than the resulting grazes on your palms your clumsiness wrought you you tell the mermaid that there was nothing so very heroic about all of that you were simply excited that is all to see her again or you were simply excited and that's all to see her again you weren't thinking well, that makes two of us. I was excited to see you again. She was? Naturally. I had a very good time speaking to you last night. I had hoped that we might resume our correspondence. That's why I came to the rocks a bit earlier than usual. I was waiting for you. Did you hear my song? Yes, you reply. With a nod of your head. You heard it all the way in the abandoned cottage. It called out to you. That was the general idea. I was singing for you. She was. You do not think that you're worthy of the mermaid's song, but if she does not mind dedicating her voice to you, then... Well, who else would I dedicate my voice to? There's nobody else to hear me. That's a good point, you suppose. Charlie, you look back at the mermaid. You thank her for her song. It was very beautiful. And tell her before you can lose your nerve that you have prepared a present for her, too. Oh, have you really? You have. It is a small thing, nothing more than a silly trinket, but it would not be too much of an uh, imposition then. With clumsy fingers, you reach into your pocket, and then you take out a gun. Now, um, <laughs> for a few moments, you fret that your near fall down the cliff might have damaged the de delicate chain nestled within it, but your worries are in vain. The chain is surprisingly sturdy, Given it was made with only a few flowers, it was held firm against the odds. You handle the chain with great care all the same, however, as you hold it out, presenting it for the mermaid's approbation. It was for the mermaid that you fashioned this chain. You thought it would look nice nestled in her hair. You were pleased with the chain when you first made it, but after looking at the mermaid, you've begun to reconsider. The mermaid's beauty is otherworldly, so much so it almost hurts to look at her. A flower crown, by comparison, seems a very meager offering indeed. The longer you hold your gift out, the more unworthy it feels. You have half a mind as the seconds elapse to snatch your silly, wholly unworthy gift back from the mermaid before she can judge you too harshly. But the mermaid's lips curve upwards into a smile, and a voice so full of gratitude it makes your heart throb. She says, Oh my, did you make this for me? Well, yes, you reply, still feeling a little flustered. You saw these flowers earlier when you went for a walk, and they made you think of her. 
Not, you hasten to add, that you think her beauty is comparable to these flowers. <laughs> Which is a mermaid simp. Uh, they're far inferior when contrasted with her good looks. You simply thought, you were unable to get the rest of the sentence out, however, because the mermaid interrupts you, not rudely, but with something resembling compassion. Perhaps she pities you. She might be able to hear how your voice is trembling. And she also see the way your hands tremor. Oh dear. Faint hard never won the hand of a fair maiden, you know. I happens all your confidence? I think that your gift is a wonderful one. I did not at all expect it, but it really is pretty. You look at your feet, too shy to meet the mermaid's gaze. Then you say very quietly that you're glad that she thinks so, but she does not need to spare your ego. You have precious little of it left as it is. The memory seems touched by your shyness. Perhaps she likes her prey to be self-conscious, as she literally, you know, eats you. No, uh, because she smiles. I'm not simply saying things to spare your ego. I'm not like that. Humans might spell platitudes as easily as they breathe air, but I do not compliment others unless I truly mean it. Is that not the point of speech? To have an honest dialogue with one another? If one party in a conversation is withholding their true intentions, then conversation is impossible. Playing games is a waste of my time, particularly given my time above the surface is so very limited. Oh, blush at this more deeply still, and survey the mermaid beneath the full fringe of your eyelashes. And truly does like it? Didn't I not just say that? You humans are so very funny. With what with all your second guessing, he was like that too in the beginning. She? My friend. The mermaid's answer is a simple one, but it makes your stomach clench regardless. Ah yes, the friend. How could you have forgotten about her? The competition. <laughs> she used to make me gifts too. You know, gifts like this one. She would pick flowers in the cliffs over there where it cannot tread. The mermaid gestures with one hand the cliffs, which tower above the shore. Tall and imposing as though to stab the sky above. And she was fashioned them into crowns like this one, and bracelets. I was appreciative of her tokens, though she was similarly shy when first she presented them to me. She did not seem to think very much of her handiwork. You and her are remarkably similar, really. There's no guile in the mermaid's voice, but words have a rather have rather taken the wind out of your sail. Of course the cowherd gave the mermaids kiss. What a bitch. I mean, what? <laughs> cowherd. Why was, she, why was she not? The mermaid is beautiful. She's very, so very beautiful. Like a... The tutelary goddess? Tutelary. Tutelary. Like a, like a protector, a guardian. Or patron, I guess. Tutelary. Tut tutelary. Like a tutelary goddess, she seems to invite tribute simply by existing. It was not by my hand that, that I was once again given flesh. Um, no. I don't know. I'm just reminded of, like, Castlevania. What do you say? Like, by men who. You, some, some, something about tribute, you know? I remember tribute. I was called here by humans who wish to pay me tribute <laughs> or something like that anyway um uh were you more religious or more irreligious maybe you might even consider worshiping her though in essence is that not what you were doing with your flower crown you know i'm just thinking you know, now i'm thinking of goddesses now when i think of goddesses i think of vtubers <laughs> you know i don't know it's just me i just it's just a connection there you know, worshipping goddesses like worshipping VTubers. I'm just thinking, is there like a, a mermaid VTuber? Probably. There's like a VTuber for everything now. You know, there's a VTuber for every single like anime trope that you can think of. I mean, mermaid is probably a classic one. Um, though in essence, is that not what you were doing with your flower crown? How silly of you to think that your idea was an original one. I might be accustomed to gifts, but it's been a long time since any human has bequeathed you of anything. This is a pleasant surprise. I'm truly thankful for your kindness, dear one. The mermaid leans forward on her rocks, so as to pluck the necklace from your fingers. A benevolent smile, all the while, is unwavering. And now that I look at your gift more closely, I rather think it's of a superior quality to the gifts my old friend once gave me. 
Now this is enough to make you start. If the touch of the mermaid's fingers upon your own was not. Could your silly gift really be better than those she once accepted? I think so. My friend's trinkets were all rather clumsy in execution, though I cherished them nonetheless. They were very precious to me. And I feel like there's, already, there's a lot of underhanded compl uh, compliments that she's doing, you know, about her old friend. Like, she, she said her old friend was basically not very pretty, you know, and now she's saying her friends it, they didn't really make any really good gifts. You know, I was like, I don't know. They did not last very long, though. Now when I took them with me to my home beneath the ocean, the water soon ran the fragile links between the flower stems asunder. Your uh, diadem, however, seems more sturdy, but it is by the same, uh, same token very delicate. You must be very good with your hands. I think that back briefly at your disastrous sewing lessons in the past. Have your numerous failed attempts to thread your needle, or the other girls giggle at you and you blush. You think the mermaid's praise might be a touch too effusive. You tell the mermaid as much, but she only laughs. I do not think so. Now. The mermaid places your floral trinket upon her head, over her long, fair hair, and serves you in a manner which seems almost... Uh, coquette, coquettish, 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 I've, I've seen this word before, coquettish. Coquettish. Coquettish, it's coquettish. Coquettish, basically acting flirt, flirty. Uh, coquettish. And it serves you in a manner which seems almost coquettish. You know, I'm making very extensive use of, of Google, you know, translate. You know, I don't know if there's an easy way to get like Google text-to-speech, but basically that's what I'm using. <laughs> I'm using Google Translate, even though I'm not translating anything. It's just so I can get the text to speak. I know how to pronounce it. Um, what do you think? You think that the mermaid looks radiant, though that is less because of your gift and more because of her natural looks. You tell the mermaid this, though not in terms quite this glowing, or not in terms, or though not in terms quite this glowing, and she giggles. You are selling yourself too short. I think your gift is lovely, really. The flowers really rather match my hair. Yes, you answer with a nod of your head. That's why you picked those flowers. For many nights, she is all you have been able to think of. I am glad you have been thinking of me. I, in truth, have been thinking of you, though I do not wish to say as much. No? No. It will be embarrassing to confess to how much I have been looking forward to a reunion if you do not feel similarly. I do not care to pine for humans from afar, just like that one Disney movie. But if you care for me as I do you, then it makes me feel less alone. You hasten to assure the mermaid in your face of flame. <laughs> do you ever stop blushing? Goodness gracious. Uh, you do care for her, very much so. You've not known for her very long, but you certainly made an impression upon you. She is such an easy conversationalist, the time simply slips by when you're together. It is not heard, of course, that she's so pretty. I have heard it said, yes, that my looks are rather appealing. My old friend was similarly complimentary. I cannot blame you humans for being so taken with me. My form is so very graceful with my big fishy tail. You know, it's, it's, it's just a tail, you know. It's, it's not about her like upper body, you know, it's just the humans just really like her tail. Uh, your legs seem rather cumbersome in comparison to my smooth, sleek tail. It must be so very depressing to lumber about on glens you do. Living your days beneath the harsh sun or the harsh sun and the cool, unfeeling moon. Sometimes I rather think I pity you. But the surface is a good deal brighter than it is beneath the ocean. I will grant you that much. You agree with the mermaid, still feeling flushed, that there are some perks to having legs. Uh yeah, there's still some perks to having legs, the groom which makes the mermaid giggle. I am certain that they are. Though you can explore the ocean's depths as I can. I presume you have never tried it. You shake your head, no. Never thought to do so, largely because you have never been so close to the sea before. Not in all your life. You did not have much opportunity for nautical exploration in the past. You are not allowed to go anywhere then, save to the local church. It was quite a lonely existence. Well now, that's a pity. You are kind enough to give me a gift, fashioned from flowers which grow where I cannot reach them. So perhaps I ought to return the favor. A favor? Yes, that's right. It, it would seem only fitting that I give to you something which can only be found in the ocean's depths. 
Perhaps we could look at it as a form of cultural exchange. Oh no, you protest, your eyes wide. You couldn't possibly put such a burden upon her. You do not give her a gift after all, because you want to receive anything in return. Anything other than her friendship, that is. The conversation is more than enough to satisfy you. You do not need any physical presence on top of that. The memory does not seem convinced, however, by your naysaying. She raises one eyebrow. Even this gesture is performed elegantly. <laughs> even raising an eyebrow is elegant. You know? you know, even if she burps, you know, even if she like burps or like farts or something, it's still ele it's still described as elegant. You know, that's just that's just the 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 feeling that I'm getting. You know, the tone. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, she raises one eyebrow and then says, "If my company is all it takes to satisfy you, then you're easy to please indeed. The please does not rebuff. I'm offering it because I wish." To. But do, do fish fart though? You know, that's an interesting question. Do fish fart? You know, I don't know. Do they have butts? Anyway, remember what I said. I do not say things for, uh, yeah, for the sake of it. Well, you murmur, if she really doesn't mind. Of course I do not mind. Now wait there. I will not be very long. It would be rude to abandon my new friend in the midst of a conversation. The mermaid turns her attention towards the clear, mirror-like water which shimmers beneath the moonlight. Then she dives. Her body arcs elegantly through the air, her long, slender limbs cleaving to the surface of the water which nary a uh, ripple. The mermaid's face is first submerged, then her torso and at long last her tail. The water rushes forth to envelop her, as though it has been waiting for her. It subsumes her. It swallows her. Then she disappears from view. The mermaid is gone, but you're still here. Well, now what are you to do? There's nothing that can be done, you suppose, save waiting. You stand there for several moments, watching the black water lap against the shore. The breeze howls mournfully, like a wounded animal, as it buffets your hair about your face and your torn skirt around your legs. Time elapses, but how much of it? While you stand there, fretfully, feeling as ostentious. Aus or ostentatious. Ostentatious. I remember. I remember how to pronounce that. Ostentatious is a maypole. When will the mermaid return? Will she ever return? You're starting to worry. Is that all you do? When? Look. Over there. At the rocks upon which the mermaid once sat, the water is rippling. It looks as though your new friend has returned. The mermaid pulls herself onto the rocks, using a surprising amount of upper body strength and smiles. Just freaking six pack abs or something, you know, not really drawn in the uh, in the art. But I imagine, you know, I mean, if you swim all day, you know, I imagine you get very fit. I don't know. Um, I apologize for the wait. I hope I did not make you worry. You were worrying, but you're not half so honest as the mermaid. Mermaids might be spoken of as devious tricksters who lower sailors to their deaths, but they are in actuality very sincere. They're much sincere, or they're much more sincere than most humans. Perhaps that's why your kind fears them so. There are few creatures who inhabit this world whose capacity for lying is greater than your own. You tell the mermaid that you are not worrying. She answers with a wry smile. I am not so sure about that. Ah, the mermaid is... Wilier than you are giving her credit for, she has seen straight through you. But no matter. It took me some time, but I was finally able to retrieve for you a gift. I do not have the means to turn this into a pretty piece of jewelry, as you did of the flowers, but I wish to give it to you nonetheless. I do hope that you like it. The mermaid leans forward and holds her gift out towards you, her slender fingers unfurl about it, like the petals of a flower being folded back and... Oh, what a pretty gift it is. The ocean might be dark and deep, cold and unfeeling, but the same cannot be said for the object which glitters upon the mermaid's palm. She has fished from the depths of the water a beautiful shell, one which shimmers prismatic colors beneath the moon's light, much like the scales in her tail. The shell is so very pretty, it quite takes your breath away. You look at the shell worriedly, your teeth biting your lower lip. That's a bad habit, you know. You'll make yourself bleed. <laughs> Then ask the mermaid if this is really all right. Would a gift like this not be wasted on you? This like shiny shell that <laughs> you got from the ocean. Of course not. I want you to have this shell because it makes me think of you. It does? How so? I thought it should be obvious. 
The shell is lovely fine. As you are. That's, that's quite the riz, you know, the mermaid has. Anyway. Oh, did she just call you lovely? Surely you must have misheard her. You'll seriously believe it. It's an awful lot for you to take in, but... Now nah, why are you gawping at me like that? The wind will change, you know, and then your face will be struck like that, which would be quite the shame. You would waste your good looks, which for a maiden such as yourself would be nothing short of a tragedy. It seems as though the mermaid really does think you are pretty after all. Mermaid, with her smooth skin, her fair, fair hair. You scarcely believe it, you know, considering the fact that you've been running all day in the forest and... You know, you slept in like a abandoned cottage. You probably didn't have time to shower and your hair is probably a mess. And, you know, you probably, I don't know. The may, I, I'm assuming makeup did exist. I don't know. I, I was going to say, like, I wonder if makeup existed back then. You know, and how, like, hey, what setting we're in. You know, I feel like we're kind of like a medieval fantasy kind of setting. Maybe like Victorian age, sort of, maybe. Because like, there's like schools and stuff. I don't know. Victorian or like, um, I don't know, Renaissance, maybe a little bit. You know, that kind of like ambiguous medieval fantasy setting. Um, so I'm just like, you know, probably not in the best shape, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, you can seriously believe it. There's something almost laughable about the mermaid's compliments. How could she call you pretty when her looks are so immediately, obviously superior? Tongue tied, you look at your feet. You do not know how to reply to the mermaid. You have half a mind to refute her words. It's so all that you're not that pretty, not really, but you fear that you might look rude. You do not want to rebuff the mermaid's well wishes. There's nothing for it then, but to take the shell which the mermaid retrieved from the ocean's depths for you. You do not think that you're worthy of it, but neither do you want to refuse it. Now that is a surprise, the mermaid says, amused as you reach for the shell. I do not think you'd be bold enough to take it. Now without more coaxing on my part. You have exceeded my expectations. What a good girl you are. Your heart flutters with his praise, and it flutters all the more when your trembling fingers brush against the mermaid's palm. It presses the shell into your skin, and your own fingers tighten about it. The shell is sharp and pointed, and it digs uncomfortably into your skin. It hurts, but there's pleasure in the pain. What? This too feels like a gift in the mermaid. You really want to get spanked by this mermaid. I mean, what? You do not want to spurn it. Even pain can be a precious thing when dealt by one whom you care for. I mean, um, that's kind of that. I think that's just a fetish, bro. Uh, you never knew that before. You hold the shell to your heart, which is beating an irregular rhythm, and look at the mermaid. Then, very softly, you thank her. It is quite all right. It seems only fair after you shared part of your world with me. Was that was that the song you know from from uh, Little Mermaid? Part of your world, you know, something like that. I can't remember the song. Anyway, I wish to share part of my world with you too. Humans cannot normally descend beneath the ocean's depths, and even if they do, they cannot remain there for very long. You are far too fragile. Would that I could, I would bring you with me, to my underwater kingdom, where we might be together. The mermaid's melodic voice trills away, suffused with something resembling melancholia. She sighs. Then she shakes her head and smiles. But this will have to do, for the present. Please, take good care of that shell. You know, until you, until you, until your, until your species invents scuba diving. You know, you can't really visit Atlantis, I guess. Look at it from time to time and think of me. That would make me very happy indeed. In the days past, following this nightly encounter with your aquatic acquaintance, of an almost intolerable slowness. You enjoy the hours of sunlight as best you can by going for long, bracing walks amidst the uh, heather, foraging for berries and fruits among the hedgerows. You, even when you have mustered un up enough courage, take an old fishing line uncovered in the fisherman's cottage and try to look by the shore. You know, how does she feel about, about e us eating fish? <laughs> you know, I know in the Disney movie, obviously the mermaids living peacefully with the fish and everything, but I mean, I mean, I don't know. If, if if the mermaids are also like omnivores, you know, does it really matter? Do they also eat the fish? Or are they vegetarian? I don't know. <laughs> your initial attempts at angling are without success, but as time passes, your proficiency in the art grows. Sometime after you take up your rod, 
You find you're able to catch the odd fish here and there, small scrawny things mostly, but the meat goes a ways to bolstering your rudimentary diet. You teach yourself how to remove the scales of these saltwater fish that you captured, and how to gut them. How do we get the, how do we get like a knife, you know? I guess it was in the cottage. You learn too how to cook them over a simple fire. Sometimes you screw these fish of yours on spikes and roast them slowly, innards and all. You're able to sustain yourself well enough during the day, but the faint pains of hunger, uh, hunger you experience never quite go away. Your physical discomfort, however, is secondary compared to your desire to visit the mermaid. Your days might be dull and drab, but your nights comparatively are made of magic. It's only during the night that the mermaid emerges from beneath the waves, and when she does, she, you hurry to her side. Never before had anybody who took so great an interest in you, not until you met the mermaid. That's why she has grown to mean so very much to you. And that's why you scale the cliff every single day until you, you know, just get like incredible like biceps. You know, and like incredible muscular body. <laughs> uh, she, is a, she is the first friend you ever had. But if you do not temper your obsession accordingly, I fear she may very be your last. You care little for the potential danger, however, which lurks beneath your interactions with the mermaid. You want only to show the mermaid how much that you value her. And you hope within time that she will come to value you too. Va value you too. Value you too. It's kind of a tongue twister. Value you. If you keep seeing her, surely you will stop thinking of her human friend whom she lost so suddenly. That is your plan at least. You know, to make her forget about her ex. Fortunately, your self-serving wish to grow closer to the mermaid seems close to being granted. Your nightly conversations, when you greet her, come easily enough. The words tumbling from your mouth like thread. You have grown rather comfortable in the mermaid's company, and she yours. She must have, for it is not long after you bequeath your diadem of flowers to the mermaid that she looks at you, and posits a curious question. She still has it. Somehow, yeah, it survives the, uh, the ocean. You press X, by the way. I don't know why I wouldn't close. I think that I guess I would close the game, maybe. Um, I was wondering, dear one, whether you would mind indulging me. I know this might not seem like an appealing proposition, but I thought it would be a remiss of me not to ask. I've seen some of your world, for I've sat on the shore for many, many nights. And, but, you have seen nothing of mine. It seems unfair that I should show, or I should know some of the world that you inhabit, or you know so little of my own. So, would you care to come with me, beneath the ocean's waves? There's much that I wish to show you, sights that cannot, I fear, be accurately represented in language alone. Words can be awfully stifling when it comes to communication of experiences such as this. It's quite the florid speech, but the heart of it beats a simple enough request. The mermaid wishes to bring you beneath the ocean's surface so that she might show you her home. You are flattered initially that the mermaid wishes to show you something so personal. But after this flutter of flattery, there comes an uncomfortable sense of unease. The mermaid might feel at home beneath the water's surface, but what of you? You're a human girl of two awkward, ungainly legs. You're not made to live under the sea. Under the sea. <laughs> Down is better. Oh, was it like... Under the sea, hours wetter, honey, yeah, it's better, take it from me. I don't know, something like that. You frown and mistrustfully, uh, you look at the ocean. It is late at night, as it always is when you speak to the mermaid, and the water does not look blue. It appears instead to be obsidian. The waves moan as they break against the rocks, which jowl the shore like a mighty dragon's bones. They sound angry, violent. Almost. Salty sea spray arcs or salty sea spray. Sometimes I mix up the nouns and the verbs. Because I, I don't know if it's a verb or a noun when I first read it. Uh, salty sea spray arcs through the air, calling the moonlight. It shimmers, sharp as knives. Hesitantly, you take a step back. You are a little afraid of the sea. You're so restless, so deep, and so all consuming. It reminds you of a hungry monster. You've never submerged yourself beneath the ocean before. You never had the opportunity. You do not even know how to swim. You are fearful for your own safety. You consent to die beneath the undulating meniscus of the water, but... Do not look so frightened, dear one. I will be with you. I will not let you go. You have my word. 
shyly you glance at the mermaid. She still perched upon her rock, her hands folded neatly upon her. Well, she does not have a lap, not really. You're still afraid, but the mermaid's reassurance does help. Has she not told you numerous times that she is nothing if not honest? You trust her not to break her word. She did not leave you beneath the waves, abandoning you to a cruel, lonely fate, become the food of so many fish. Of that you are certain. That's why, despite all your misgivings, you find yourself nodding your head, and this is a horrible idea. If that's what she wants, then you will accompany her. You're interested too in what lies beneath the ocean's surface, out of sight. Oh, I knew that you would agree. Thank you very much for humoring me. I will endeavor to make these next few months the most memorable you have ever experienced. Now, would you care to come with me? I shall be your guide. The ocean's depths might be dark, but not let you get away from me, I promise. The mermaid extends her hand towards you, and it seems to cut through the moonlight just like a blade. The moon's celestial rays lay against the mermaid's upturned palms on her shimmers. The mermaid's hair, too, is glowing, backlit by Celine's glow, so that she almost looks like an angel. Celine's glow? Celine, like maybe the name of like a, like a the moon, <laughs> or I don't know, I'm not sure. Celine. I thought the I thought the moon's name was Luna. I don't know. Anyway, her beauty is such that for a few moments you cannot do anything, neither step towards her nor back away. Or maybe it's like Celine's like maybe like a star constellation, maybe? Uh, I don't know. Anyway. If you're frozen in place, rooted into the sand, like some shore growing tree, you still do not, do not understand why the mermaid has taken such an interest in you. But an old adage does occur to you. You ought not to look a gift horse in the mouth, or ignore the pleas of a graceful, dignified mermaid. You reach out, your arm shaking like a skinny bough of an ancient tree, and find the mermaid's hand with your own. The mermaid's fingers curl by your own. Her nails, only now you notice how sharp they are, digging into your skin. Though the mermaid herself looks very soft, the grip is surprisingly strong. You do not think if she willed it, you would get away from her. But why would, she wa why would you want to? She does not mean you any harm. Now, let us be on our way. There's much to see in my underwater kingdom, and I cannot wait to show it to you. The mermaid turns towards the ocean as do you. A brief moment passes, one during which you allow yourself to stand there, your hand claimed by the mermaid, as the wind buffets your hair and skirts. Skirts? skirts? Oh, okay, well, well, actually, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I was thinking like skirts, like there's only one skirt, it's your skirt, right? And I thought maybe, well, skirts as in like the mermaid has a skirt, but no, she's just not wearing anything actually, as far as I know. And she wouldn't wear a skirt for like a mermaid tail anyway. Oh, could you, could a mermaid wear a skirt? I mean, I guess she could. Anyway. I feel like that's a title. Maybe? Which is surprising because the writing is so very much of a higher caliber, you know, than like most indie visual novels, I would say. I feel like the developer has a lot of experience. Or at the very least. I don't know, they're writing a very, um... Uh, how, well, how do you say? They're writing at a university level, I feel like. You know, writing the fucking novel. Which in its own way, I, I'm, I don't know how I feel about it. You know, I, usually visual novels are not written in the, like uh, like a book. You know, when you write a book, it's 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 a little bit different than it is when you write from like a visual novel. I feel like, but it depends on the style. I guess. You don't have to write it like in a particular way. I mean, that's what art is. You can write it in any way you want. I don't know, it just feels like a book, you know, it feels more like a book than a visual novel. Um, you know, even though novel is in the name of visual novel, but... Uh, anyway. uh, you inhale deeply. The smell of the song is heavy in the back of your nostrils, so much so you could choke on it. It is not a particularly pleasant smell, but you've grown accustomed to it after living your tumble town or tum tumble, tumble town, tum tumble down cottage by the shore. It is nostalgic almost. You have a vague feeling, as you stand on the precipice between your world and that of your aquatic companions, that you might never again be able to smell the sun in the air like this. That's just a silly supposition, though. You are being foolish. The mermaid will return you back to your surface in due course, will she not? We hope that she will. You, unlike her, cannot breathe on the water. You open your mouth, meaning to ask the mermaid about this fact, but you now afforded the opportunity to speak. The mermaid has already shifted. Fingers still twined about yours. She dives forwards, her body slicing through the surface of the water like a knife, and you, inexorably, or inexorably, are dragged along with her. 
You better hold your breath. The face kind of looks kind of silly. In that angle, but anyway. Uh, the water rushes forwards to meet you in a sudden shocking rush. The mermaid's descent might be graceful, but yours is anything but. You don't know how to position your legs, and your limbs feel awfully ungainly. Also, you should, I don't know if you should open your mouth, you know, it, under the water. I don't know. Unless, I don't know, you can make like an air bubble, I guess. But usually, you want to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> anyway, um, you know how to position your legs, your limbs feel awfully ungainly. The shock of the water as it touches your skin, meanwhile, is intense. But you do not think the water would be this cold. No, it's not just cold, it's, it is freezing. It feels as though all the warmth has been sapped out of your skin. If your head was not already beneath the ocean's waves, you would gasp from it. You do not gasp, however, you cannot. You've already been submerged. Your body no longer feels as though it is your own. Your hair is unspooling behind you like thread, your skirt is fluttering. You know, how are we gonna like, you know, after we, I'm assu assuming we live, you know, it's gonna be very cold, you know, like in the middle of the night when our clothes are all wet. I don't know. Your body rocks to and fro as though being soothed in mother's arms. It is a curious feeling. But it's not wholly unpleasant. If only it were not so cold down here beneath the ocean's depths, you might find it relaxing. It is dark under the surface of the water, yes, but you have not ventured so very far, not yet at least, that the glow of the moon cannot penetrate its depths. The surroundings are illuminated though, faintly, and thanks to this precious illumination, you can see the schools of fish swimming about you. Mm, free food. Uh, no, their scales all glisten as they arc through the waves like rainbows. They do not look like life forms. They appear instead to your fairy tale adult mind. To be ancient relics brought to life through some strange arcane sorcery. They are pretty. No, that word is not significant enough. They are beautiful. You do not know as you stood upon the shore how very full of life was beneath the water's surface. Or how, yeah, how, how full of life it was beneath the surface. You do not know either how very beautiful these aquatic denizens of the deep were. You have never seen fish like these before, not in real life. You have memories, vague, hazy memories, of dissecting a fish once in a particularly gruesome biology lesson. But that feels like a very long time ago now. You would far rather think on your present than dwell upon the past. But the seconds pass, and as they do, the mermaid continues to swim, leading you deeper and deeper in the ocean's depths. But once you were close enough to the surface of the moon's light, you could still slice through the waves. Now it's so very dark, you sorcery see. Your vision is beginning to blur. Oh no, there's this, there's this thing called drowning. Uh, you can feel an uncomfortable pressure weighing down your inert body. You have descended, you realize, with a ripple of anxiety. Too deep. Demons were not meant to descend to these depths. The water, once cold, now feels freezing. It caresses every inch of exposed flesh as if to sap what little warmth you might still possess. You shiver, and when you do, you swear you can hear your teeth chattering, despite the water which stops your ears. The water is stopping up your nostrils. There's so much water down here at the bottom of the ocean. It's endless. The mermaid may be able to breathe on the water, but you're not so very fortunate. Your body is far less sophisticated than hers. It requires oxygen with which to furnish your body with continuous strength, not salt water. The thought of trying to inhale the endless water which surrounds you makes you shudder. You'd rather not attempt it. You do not have gills. Why will the mermaid take you back to the surface? Surely she must know that you have fast begun to near your limit. Surely. <laughs> You've been under the water for far too long. It's too cold. It's so dark now. In any event, you cannot see much of anything. The joy once you felt during your underwater adventure has begun to dissipate. It's like the last of the oxygen you still possess. It's time to return to the surface now, but how are you able to communicate with the mermaid? You know, I mean, if you really if you thought about this, we should really be, have like planned this a little more. <laughs> Instead of just simply uh, blindly following the mermaid's lead. You cannot speak and she's not looking at you. She's staring and saying fixedly, something beyond your comprehension. Something far away, perhaps, in the underworld of gloom they cannot see. Not knowing what else to do, you try to pull your arm free from the mermaid's grasp. You hope that it will signal to her that she has grown too carried away in her endeavors. That she ought to cut short your expedition and return you to the shore. The mermaid does not react, however, to her attempts to escape her. The grip does not slacken, as you had hoped, from about your wrists. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It feels as though she is gripping you more tightly than she was, as if to prevent your escape. But why would she do that? You tap on the mermaid's shoulder to get her attention, 
a gesture which prompts her a long last return. Her fair hair billows about her, suspended in the water like a shroud. Then, she says, in that calm, measured, incredibly reasonable voice of hers, Yes, dear one, what is it? If you could, you would open your mouth to reply to her, but alas, you're a human girl, not a fish. You cannot speak underwater. Any attempt to do so would accomplish not. They fill in your pretty little mouth with water. The mermaid really ought to have to consider that before she started to ask you questions. But your comfort seems to be the last thing in the mermaid's mind. She smiles at you gently, delicately, and says, I understand. It's beginning to wear on you, is it not? Being underwater for so long is the beginning to take its toll. Do your lungs feel like iron? Are they heavy? So she does understand your woes. She might not be able to, or you might not be able to speak, suspended as you are in the dark, murky depths, but communication is not wholly impossible. You nod your head emphatically, hoping that this will be enough to make your distress apparent, but... Yes, that, is, that will happen. It is a natural part, or so I've heard, of drowning. Not that I've ever had the opportunity to experience it for myself. I am incapable, you see, of meeting my demise in such a manner. Now what was that? What could she mean? I mean, the mermaid answers, and she reminds me that this was a calculated act upon my part. Nani, what is this? What is this treachery? Forgive me, dear one, but the moment you consent to sinking beneath the water with me, your fate was sealed. Your lungs will be flooded with water soon enough. Then you will die. This is not a pretty way to go. You need worry about your corpse bloating, disfiguring, or being eaten by fish, though. I will take very good care of it. I promise. In death, you will look lovely. Almost angelic. Is that not what you always wanted? You do not know what the mermaid thinks it is exactly that you want, but you think it, she is laboring under some severe misunderstandings. You like to try and correct her, that you do not want to die, but of course you cannot open your mouth. What a pity. Well, at least it saves me the effort of transcribing your dying pleas. I doubt they'd be particularly interesting. You know, it'll be like, help me, I'm drowning, oh no. You know, that, that's, all, that's, all be, that's all it would be. No, uh, if you will want to know why I'm doing this, then I would not mind obliging. I have no secrets to keep from you. Other than the secrets, perhaps, that upon your first meeting, she nursed within her cold fish's heart the desire to bring about your watery murder. You know, that's, that's pretty important. You might have liked to know that before you agreed to sink beneath the ocean surface of her. I'm only doing this because I have no choice. The other girl I liked, after all, the one whom I adored, disappeared. She went away, and I was never again afforded the opportunity to see her. You remind me of that girl. Though you do not look much alike, you do not act very alike either. But you are both humans, who, despite your delicacies, have no shortage of determination. How your kind is able to live when your lifespans are so very short and you are susceptible to so very many diseases, is a mystery to me. Though my lifespan far eclipses your own, and I am far sturdier, can I help but marvel at the tenacity of you humans? I know that, if I were as fragile as you are, I would not be able to exist in this world. I would be far too afraid. I would see my own death lurking behind every corner. Just as, you, as, just as you can see your own death living before you, it's not very far away now. You feel it coming closer and closer, enclosing its cold, icy fingers around your throat. You humans are, are incredible. I cannot help but respect you, weak and pitiful though you are. She respects her tenacity so very much she wishes to extinguish it. That does not make very much sense. Uh, perhaps my words are confusing you, but it makes perfect sense, to me at least. My beloved cowherd left me. I do not know where she went or what happened to her. Perhaps she was murdered by bandits. Perhaps she contracted a horrible disease. Perhaps she simply fell and cracked her skull. I do not know. I will never know. For many, many days and many, many nights, her disappearance tormented me. I cannot help but wonder how it came about. There are so many possibilities I cannot imagine all of them. This thought terrified me. It still does. That is why I am going to take you to my underwater kingdom with me. There, we can be together forever. Nothing will tear us apart then. I will brush your hair. I will dress you in the finest pearls found from the bottom of the seabed. It will be lovely, much, much lovelier than any sort of miserable existence you might be able to eke out above the water. 
In my citadel, you will never be attacked by bandits, nor ravaged by diseases. You'd be quite safe, I promise. Quite safe, yes, and quite dead too, surely. Well, yes, that is the only unfortunate aspect of my plan. She considers your death nothing more than a mere misfortune. The mermaid might be surprisingly cold after all. You know, it's funny. I think she just said like, did she just say that we're nothing like her old friend? You know, even though she did say, she said she was honest, but like, did she say before how we were kind of like similar to her old friend? But now she says we're not. You know, I don't know. She's freaking gaslighting us. Um, but yeah, she's just, she's just interested in the fact that we're human, you know, more so than anything else. She has a human fetish. Um, uh, the, the mermaid might be surprisingly cold after all, but perhaps you ought to have predicted this, you dummy. She is part fish. Her fish not cold-blooded like lizards. You probably learned this at some point during biology class, but your lessons are beginning to feel very faint and far away now. It's not going to help you now. Your body is beginning to fail you. You cannot take much more of this. It is a necessary sacrifice, though. If you are to have be uh, in, if you are to be happy, I'm doing this, you know, for both our sakes. I do apologize for tricking you, but please try to understand. I really have been lonely. You'd be more inclined to sympathize with her, perhaps, if her loneliness was not ushering in your inevitable demise. But you're too preoccupied with your dwindling resources to serve uh, oxygen to feel much in the way of anything for your captor. You can feel the pressure of the water against your eyes. They are beginning to ache. I, this is one of my fears. I mean, dying in general, you know, is like my fears. But like, you know, I mean, that's probably normal. That's why I could never really learn to swim, you know. I tried learning to swim, but like, I could just never relax in the water. I don't know, do, do, do people not feel the fear of drowning, you know, at every moment they're in the water? Maybe that's just me. Anyway. Uh... Perhaps you're crying. You do not know. The water masks much of your anguish. You've been drifting underwater for almost three minutes. Well, that's a new record. That's a remarkably long time to go without any air. Your vision is beginning to cloud. Your surroundings, already dark, look darker. Still, unpleasant and obscure. And not at all like the paradise the mermaid promised you. The pain of being suffocated slowly is far stronger and far more oppressive than the sensation of mermaid's hand wound tightly about your arm. Is there no escape for you? The prognosis, I'm sorry to say, is grim. Your fate, as the mermaid said, really was sealed the moment you met her, luxuriating on those rocks beneath the moonlight. But you'll forgive me if my sympathy is limited. You did bring this upon yourself, you know. That's what you get. That's what you get for simping for a mermaid, I guess. You reap what you sow, and in your case, you made a series of bad decisions which led to your untimely demise. I mean, I didn't make any- I mean, me per personally, the player didn't make any decisions. I just made like one decision, I just went to the shore, and that's it, you know, I didn't make any other decisions, but anyway. Now, what do you want to do? Will you accept this fate of yours and rest in peace? Or will you try to fight against it? Aha, okay, so we do have a bit of a choice here. Huh, let's, we can see the fish now, let's see the fish. Um... Let's save the game. Okay. So, do we accept our fate and become like a corpse doll? You know, to this... Like, uh... This mermaid has lived for centuries and therefore has a different kind of morality compared to humans, right? It lives for so long, you know, that, um... They're a little bit cruel, you know? In terms of... Of their own ethics, I guess. Or, do we fight against our fate anyway? Try to, like, break away from this mermaid. Try to live. Uh, even though it's probably futile anyway, you know? You know what? Why not? <laughs> let's just, let's just be... Let's just die, you know? Why not? We're gonna die anyway, I guess, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how long we're gonna be able to survive in that old cottage, you know? What, what, what future do we have anyway, I wonder? I mean, that really depends what happened to her in the first place. We don't really know her backstory, to be honest, the main character. What exactly happened? Was she running away from like, just like school in general? Like, we don't know. Or like, she was just running away because she was captured? I'm not sure. Like, she was running away from something and it's like, she would have to keep running forever. Maybe, maybe our story just ends here. Let's just accept the fate. Hmm. That's a bit of an anticlimactic answer at this juncture in your life story, but I suppose it'd be a remiss of me to lecture you too much. 
I am sure you're well aware of what a terrible series of decisions you have made. There's no need for me to belabor the point. They'll be boorish, not to mention tedious. I'm rather tired of scolding you. So instead, I think I will content myself with loving you. What, you thought on your death the mermaid was the only one who would be able to cons uh, consent you? I know I've said this before, but you really are naive. You cannot escape me, even if you're at the bottom of the deepest, darkest ocean. The world might have forsaken you, but I never will. I will never leave you. You will never be lonely again. Okay. That was strange, like, you know, fourth wall breaking there. Apparently the narrator was also like a, like a romance an option, maybe. I don't know. I guess uh, that's it. We die to the mermaid. All right. I mean, as pointless as it is, seemingly, um, what if we struggle anyway? You know, isn't that just being human? Isn't that just what we do as human beings? I feel like, you know, even when like faced against death, you know, you struggle until the very end. Because it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a natural instinct, you know, to try to live. Ah, I like that look on your face. It's a look full of determination. The self-same determination which first prompted me to take an interest in you. I can tell that you're not happy of this ending. You did not come all this way, after all, to drown. That's quite the indecorous demise, regardless of how many fine stones and shells the mermaid means to twine through your hair after your death. If you wish to carve out a new story for yourself, then I would be only too happy to indulge you. Just try not to get on the bad side. Or, <clears throat> good side. In of any homicidal nades at this time. Or, nade? Nade? What is that? Actually, I don't know what that word is. Again, a lot of words I do not know. Uh, nades. Nades. So, it's apparently water nymphs. Okay, so basically, mermaids. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Any homicidal nades uh, this time. Nayads? Kind of like, like dryads, maybe? Nayads? Except dryads is like nature in general, and like... Nayads is like... Uh, water? Anyway. The drowning of fair maidens is something of a cliché. Your fate is once again in your hands. Now I wonder, which path will you take? Ah! Interesting. So it goes back here. Alright. Huh. I don't know what what the narrator did, but I guess maybe the narrator has some kind of omnipotent power, I guess, or omni... I don't know what the word is. Om, omni, omniscience? Omniscience? I don't know. They, they have some kind of supernatural power that, I guess, reversed time, and now we're back in the past. Uh, obviously, the path of the shore is not there anymore. So I guess, instead, we have the choice to go to the village or to go to the castle. I guess, you know, we'll see what our, uh, what our choices will lead us to next time. <laughs>